several of the people who have invited me. Old friends, in fact, Karen and David and I, I think, were some of the beginning people who attended um, Lafayette's Rescue Festival in Debbie and Bill. And it seems like years, I mean, it was years ago, but it seems longer, it seems. Um, when I first began writing, so this is a nice, it's nice for me because 12 years ago I began writing and suddenly I'm reading some poems. It's, it's nice. I'd like to begin the reading with um, a political poem. I, I've been translating a lot of political poetry written by Eastern Europeans, primarily Hungarians, some of whom live in Romania. And if you know about Ceausescu, the Romanian dictator, he's been committing genocide. He's been eliminating the Hungarians who live in Transylvania, which is now part of Romania. Two of the three poets I trans I've, tr I've been translating it died of accidents, one in jail and, and one in a uh, car wreck. But Kanyadi is still alive. This is the only translation I'll read, but it's for those poets. And the whole reading is dedicated for those poets who die for, for their words. This is called, can you hear me all right? Is it, all right? This is called Bookmark by Shandor Kanyadi. There are times when books are piled into bonfires, the sacrificial smoke chokes you while one after another is burned. You feel as though your brain were singed. There are times when those who remain are hunted like rare game. They ring the bell in the dead of the night and sneak in like rats, nosing, scenting about, then knocking the shelf down. And on the pretext of your suspicious book, the law carries you off. There are times when they find more delicate ways not to give their reason why and why not, and like gizzards they mash the offal that was gobbled. Before the book comes into the world, they press it into the other world. There are times when so secretly they forget the mail's delivery. If you were bold enough to ask, like pilots, they wash their hands. There are times when, without batting an eyelid, they poke into what is in this and what is in that stripping everything. Your pants and shirt get drenched. Ashamed like a thief, with your few soiled belongings, you are left as if they had taken your brain. You are drifting into the hallway, rummaging with trembling hands, lighting your cigarettes at the wrong end, and the bitterness of your entire life bites the corner of your parched mouth. Mm. They do those things, and then they kill them. This is um, my year in Hungary convinced me that I was always apolitical and convinced me that I should become a little bit more political, try to write a political poem. Um, <clears throat> fortunately, the, the one I wrote, the first one, Partisan Review is going to be using it, and that's a good political magazine journal. It's called Gift Shop in Pech, Hungary. Pech is the city where I was teaching. Gift Shop in Pech, Hungary. They paint yellow and red, oh, excuse me, there's something you should know. There's uh, the currency in Hungary is forint, a forint, okay? Uh, 60 forints to the dollar on the regular market. Okay, gift shop in Page, Hungary. They paint yellow and red flowers on their white vases with pale green leaves and stems, some with dark blue centers, three dark blue circles with X's. The embroidery, too, in the small carved walnut boxes, flowers jutting out everywhere, not one Jew on the train to Auschwitz, which is not so far from here, not one young wife with two children dragged from her side. And African masks, the death mask, the life mask, the mask of love chiseled in a jade-like stone, so heavy I could hardly pick it up to see the naked bodies, the veils covering and uncovering them. I almost brought the many-armed lady from India, the wise fool from Vietnam. I almost paid the full thousand forints for the handmade Polish moccasins with the pointed toes and small beaded white horses, smaller men with sabers drawn as they rode off the stitched edges. I had to lift them all to feel their weight. I had to bring them close so I could see the tiny hands and feet, 
the curve of an arm, the straight nose, the buckle on his shoe, the gillyflower flower on hers. I had to feel the heaviness of their dreams, the foolishness of their hopes as they dipped black bread into the bowls, as they snuffed out the candles name by name by the tiny carved altar. I had to bend to hear their silence as they bowed from the waist and curtsied, stiff-legged without a single moan, not one face turned away, not one hand raised as they began their strange dance on the dustless shelves. And here's a, uh, I'd like to read some recent poems, poems that would be going into the next manuscript, uh, that are in the next manuscript. <clears throat> this is called Song for a Child. She wore a real pearl necklace, real pearl earrings, black silk dress and white silk scarf wrapped about her white, white neck. She was married and I was 20 when the night opened to take us into the winter wheat field and the child began. I was 20 and she was married and the doctor was kindly gray old the tray glittering with razor edges, the windows light clear. Just an hour and my son or daughter had disappeared into the fogged plastic bag thrown into the gleaming garbage pail and I held her hand, its bright red nails. She was married and I was 20, and now some nights when I read turtle and bear and rabbit stories to my living son, I can hear that other one saying nothing, making the silence grow inside me and all around me, his unformed hands and face, his blood-soft belly, the small black speck of his mute heart. It'll lighten up in a few poems, okay? Uh, but I like, you know, I just, this is what I write, so this is what I read. Um, won't lighten up a lot, but I've got a couple of funny ones planned for in the middle, so we can. <laughs> Catholic poems, so, because we were talking about Catholic, Catholics. This is called The Old Marriage. <clears throat> My grandmother, Helen Cunningham, the only, that's where I get the Irish from. God bless me and her. She became senile. It's about 85. And I can remember, I can remember going to her house. She weighed about 80 pounds and she was losing weight. She was dying. She didn't, she didn't know things. And this is about one morning going there and what she did. The old marriage. Outside in the snow, the trains squealed to stops, and men with striped jackets and hats jumped to hitch coal cars with freight cars so they could start up again. And my grandmother poured buttons onto the royal blue coffee table, bent to tell me about the white dress the day she married Horace, how he soon left to pan gold in Alaska. She showed the pictures of figs hanging from their backyard fence, her dark hair down to her waist, and when I looked into her eyes, she slid the gold ring over my finger, whispered her horse had never loved her, not in their 60 years of marriage. She would leave with me in my blue car if I would have her. Peanut butter stuck to her lips. A film of milk coated her old woman's mustache, and yet I considered it at 10. Thought about walking out that door with her 80-pound bent body beside me. I stared at the room and her blue watery eyes, the hairs curling from her ears and nose, and still I loved her, felt the thin skin slide over the bones in her hand I held under the table so Horace wouldn't see. Lovers, my grandmother who couldn't remember her name, and me, sipping steaming pea soup as we listened to the trains buckling and unbuckling that late November afternoon, talking about cities we'd see, the light blue dress she'd wear in the evening, our voices loud now, no longer whispering as she rose to surprise me with the plate of sliced apple, the buttered bread with sugar thickly sprinkled on it, the ice-cold glass of milk that trembled in her hand but never spilled. Okay, I'd like to read uh, <clears throat> a poem from my father and my mother. I've got the wrong book. 
and then some, Bill, I'm afraid you got, you've heard these. And Debbie, you've heard these. But, um, <clears throat> this is uh, the first poem in the Father Sequence. For those of you, have, I know some of you have read Sweet Ones. Um, father, for Raymond R. Roberts. My father sits in the dark and rocks his way back to Guadalcanal, to Guam, cutting his way through cane break, sipping rust water from his rifle's bolt, long soaking in the green bathtub brimmed with ice to break the malarial fever. Soon he will rise to bury his brother in water again so they won't tear his gold teeth out. But for now, he holds my head against his chest, the fine hand stretched across the side of my face, the fingers kneading gently my cheekbones, my nose, the valley between my lips and jaw. He is leaning down to make sure I am still breathing, saying my name lightly to see if I sleep. But I do not answer, just lie there quietly in his bony arms, knowing how hard it is for him to set me into the warm bed and walk silently out of the dark. That's, <clears throat> that's when I wouldn't speak to him. And this poem is uh, when I went to speak to him when he was dead. I, uh, the only reason I began writing was about 12 years ago I, on the anniversary of my father's death. <coughs> No, which is November 2nd, it's coming up. I always write on that day. Uh, I wrote a series of letters to him that I read in an open reading at Lafayette, and Ginsburg was in the, in, the, in the audience, and he came up to me afterwards and said, those are poems, and it's great, and they're really nice. <clears throat> so I began a career, but it was all because I was communicating with him. So I always read father poems. This, is, this poem is, is a father poem. It's called When the Dead Speak. <clears throat> he didn't talk much to me, and he's talked more to me since he's been dead than he ever did when he was alive. When the dead speak. On the third row, at the seventeenth stone, I stare at the etched angel's wings that do not look at all like an angel's wings, and I repeat the name which is my father's name, and my name, and my son's name, waiting again for him to speak first, which he never did as he sat at the kitchen table. If I said hello, he said good morning, good night to my good night, silence to my silence until I did not know if it was me or him I sat with on Olmsted Street, his hand or my hand giving the two dollars, lifting the glass of beer, the cigarette, his stink or my stink rising from the piss-stained sheets. And in the silence in which he does not speak, he speaks of nothing of the empty spaces between floor and ceiling, of the empty white cup drained of coffee, of the early winter mornings without him rising for work, without his whistle and slow shuffle of stockinged feet, without the yellow teeth, the hose in his face that finally swallowed him up. Father, I say, and he says, Father, back, and I think of my son 400 miles away, Son, I say, and he says, son, and I hold my hand up as I did in grade school. Sure, I had the right answer. Shit, I say, shit, he says. God, I say, and he says, what, what, I say to him, show him showing him I am listening. And he says, what do you want, what do you want? Nothing, I say, then shout, you're dead, dead, he says to my back as I walk away. Conversations. Uh, this is my latest book, Black Wings, and it's called Black Wings because uh, when my father died, the woman he was living with at the time said that he was lying on his back, and he used to be a boxer, and, and uh, he shouted out the black wings, and he kept punching at something on his chest. Uh, he obviously didn't hit it. <laughs> um, Anyway, that's what this is about, this book. But I'd like to read one poem from my mother, about my mother, and then a poem called Black Wings. I've seen the black wings twice myself. This is called We, from my mother. I see her lying in the dark of St. John's Alley, 
her mother and father downstairs at the table eating cake they would not share with their nine children, the young boy next to her smoking, his head propped up on one arm, talking to her and her refusing to answer. She was 14 and had breasts that I can feel hang from me now as they must have hung from her when she turned onto her stomach, the weight throwing her off balance just enough to notice. And my hand is the boy's hand reaching out in the dark to touch them, hard, full, playing with the nipples until she became excited, felt the soft giving begin as she could not stop for the rest of her life. There we are, lovers, the boy and I watching her leave the child she was behind, watching her move into the rhythm of her years, twisting, jerky movements that rocked the bed, her eyes closed as I, he, we, rise on top of her and break her apart. What is love if not this? She taught me all those years in the hallway as she swung the broom again, broke it over my back, kicked me when I went down, 10, forcing me after to put my arm around her shoulder, her white body trembling in the silvery mirror, my body standing beside her, perfectly still. Love poem. <clears throat> I'm almost afraid to try to get that one published in the journal. The Black Wings. After this one, I'll read the two funny poems, okay? <clears throat> the Black Wings. All winter, the light fluff of blue, gray, or brown fur and feathers drifting on the morning porch signaled the death of some bird or mouse, the small feet and empty skin left for us as a gift from our cats, surprisingly little blood. Just yesterday, the wind knocked and I opened the door to a rabbit half eaten, its shiny guts hanging out, still alive, steaming, its glazed eyes unblinking, the same absence I had seen in my grandfather's eyes that night he stood in the living room trying to say goodbye, telling me to check the oil before I began the long drive back, the black wings growing from his shoulders, spreading in that small room until I could not breathe and so told him I had to leave and he nodded, said he understood. Standing on our winter porch, I looked around to see if they were gathering here about the white house. I stared at the blue-gray iron clouds, the arcing dried branches of the forsythia hedge, but did not sense them, not yet. And when they come, I said aloud, wanting them to know I knew who they were, it had better be for me. Me, I shouted, suddenly furious, my entire body tight, hard, refusing to turn around, or though I could hear my wife and son knock on the window, steadily tapping, calling me in from the February cold. I just don't want him to take the son or the daughter first, right? I think parents all know that. I never knew that till I became a parent. <clears throat> no wonder we've survived all these years. Okay. This is called When the Bishop Came, and it's for Donald Wilcox, who, uh, who was always well, a kid from eighth grade that I've never forgotten. Uh, well, we went to grade school all, all the way, and he's just a wild kid, and everybody, all the teachers and priests watched him, and God only knows where he is today. <clears throat> this is about when the bishop came, you know, to ask questions, and if you answered the questions, then you were confirmed, I guess. It's confirmation, right? Okay. Donald Wilcox. When the bishop came. These angels were messengers of the Lord. We were told as we sat in straight pews they had brought into the classroom because the bishop was coming with his ring and miter so he could see who could answer the sacred questions from the heavenly blue Baltimore catechism. Jimmy Legacy and Joseph McGraw in front because they were smart, followed by Gabriella Wells and Irene Tuzignat, their dresses pressed and hair curled in rolls, 
Donald Wilcox always put his fingers into. Donald, who stayed after school every day because he was sloppy, fat, and cursed. Donald, whose eyes were quiet gray, even that day father slammed him from wall to wall, the yellow cafeteria, none of us knew for what. And it was Donald the bishop saw, the black sheep so obvious in that fourth grade flock. And it was Donald he asked the nine beatitudes, the cardinal sins, the apostles, even finally the pope's name. Donald, who did not get one answer right, whose flesh turned that translucent pig pink with shame or fear or grace when the bishop walked down to his last pew in the last row by the window and put his gem-studded sparkling ring out, which Donald held up to the sun to see sacred streaks of light flash before he bowed his head and kissed. And he really did that, you know, one of those. And Donald, instead of kissing, he just held it up and flashed it against the ceiling. And we're all just shaking our heads. <laughs> this is called the sinner. I don't know how many of you are Catholic, but these memories don't go away. Uh, I guess, uh, maybe it's not just Catholicism, but this is called the sinner in St. Bernard's. I, I was 15 at the time, and I had forged a work card, so I was a lifeguard away. I, I said I was 18, I was away lifeguarding for the whole summer, 15 in my own lifeguard's cabin. <clears throat> Met women, young girls for the first time like that. And I came back to confession. I lived in a small town, something like Scranton, but only 15,000 people. And I was going to go to confession. It was the end of August, and I was going to wipe away my sins and begin all over again. <laughs> and, uh, but there was a foreign priest in the confessional, which I didn't know. <clears throat> I thought it would be Father Flanagan, truly Father Flanagan was his name, or Monsignor McQueen, who, you know, would give you three Our Fathers or something. This was a Spanish priest who was here for a month. Um, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't give me forgiveness. <laughs> and, and you know how it is when you're, when you're standing there and, and everyone in Cajos is there right, and you walk out, he screamed at me in the confessional, and so I was, I'm sitting kneeling in the box, and I'm thinking, I have to go out there, and everyone's going to see me, <laughs> and everyone did see me, and, all right, this is the sinner in St. Bernard's, that dark afternoon in St. Bernard's, when the foreign priest screamed as I confessed, I had to walk out into the suffering light of saints, sifting from the stained glass windows down to every face I knew in Cahos staring back at the recognized sinner. Father, forgive me, I had begun. I've touched a girl's breast by the river and stolen and lied. I've taken the name of the Lord and my mother in vain. And I've watched the naked girls sit in geometry class, poring over right angles and perfect circles, Maureen without her matching skirt and blouse, Sylvia sitting straight up by the crumpled pastel blue dress, and I had them there, Lord, on the red painted floor of my imagination where I burn daily, but especially at night in Danny's pizzeria when their loveliness hangs down in the form of Mary Magdalene or Delilah or Donna who attacked me in the silver gray Chevy who ripped the buttons off my shirt. Staggering out of the confessional's curtain, blinded by the new light, I heard the priest furiously pounding on the dark screen, screaming behind me, no absolve, no absolve, repent, repent, maybe next week, trying to scare me with the fires of hell that blazed before me from the mural on the church wall which I glided by as quickly as I could, not wanting the good people who waited in line for forgiveness to know who I was at 15, a young man marked with the black ashes of the cross on his unwrinkled forehead, the black ashes of lust already mounding in his heart that yearned, my God, for the silvery light of the Ransom Street Diner where Maria served up the best hot dogs and sauerkraut, the gold cross hanging on her heavenly breasts, which I bent and touched, swearing I would never go back. Kind of serious, I guess. This is another adolescent sex poem, or would-be would be sex poem. Uh, 
I used to work at the Cohoes Drive-In. I used to work at the Cohoes Theater, and then I used to work at the Cohoes Drive-In, too, which gives you a lot of material. Uh, this is called working the counter at the Cohoes Drive-In. Those nights at the drive-in, when Johnny Michaels touched any breast he wanted, when I heard Irene and Jeanette and Karen with a great ass all talk about Frank or Richie or Kevin, not one of them saw me as I handed over popcorn, jujube fruits, and soft cups of RC. At intermission, when they all slid from their half-open doors, tucking their shirts in, adjusting their bras, their belts, I peered from the mosquito-laden air of the dingiest yellow bulb in the world, by the corner of the whitewashed concrete bunker where red neon signs flashed hot dogs, flashed Coca-Cola, and I waited, pressed, starched white, starved for one little feel. As they stumbled into the light like ghosts, I saw the screen rise into the night where candy counter girls dressed in red and white stripes walked off the edges into the stars. And I saw the cars placed like tanks ready to mount the small hills upon which they were haphazardly parked, a rare light flaring because someone's still passion-driven foot kicked the brake, a horn blaring, a tossing body's mistake, knifing its sudden shriek into the nerve-filled night where abandoned headphones hung limply from poles, their small voices speaking endlessly into the drive-in's dark. <sighs> Uh, this is called Talking to the Poison Sumac. I really wish I had lighter poems to read for you all, <laughs> but I don't. Talking to the Poison Sumac. Bending the poison sumac down to my lips, I told it the name of my older brother, the one with the mad light of winter in his eyes who could not walk up a flight of steps without stopping to catch his breath. And I looked into the hard buds, pried a few up, long, narrow pits of poison I let drop, let the branch spring back into the cold sky. Soon he would whirl away like that, leave his 30 years on the VA's iron bunk, hundreds of electric shocks, the innumerable pills that at the beginning he liked the colors of, would call me in another state to say he was now taking the green, yellow, blue, the white, red, black, laughing at the sickness he had become. And I didn't know why I was out there thinking of his soft body I had not held for more than 20 years, repeating his story when I knew that nothing I did or said mattered, that the sky was powerless and the sun setting powerless, that the snow that started to fall, the beautiful falling itself was nothing, the field, the world, the unlivable burning stars, the emptiness of it all contained here in one small human heart. Uh, I'd like to read a new poem from my brother. I've been working on some rhymes. That brother, unfortunately, uh, fortunately in a way, he died when I was in Hungary um, <clears throat> on April 6th. I, it was ironic because on April 6th, I was giving a reading in Eger, uh, which was the capital, or the, the major place for the annual English conference. And I was the major reader. And I had written a poem for him imagining he was dead. Uh, and at 7.30, which was 1.30 in the United States time, just as I was reading the poem, I found out three days later he died. Um, and I felt it, you know. That night when I went to sleep, I could feel the whole thing moving, the whole night moving. And there was this, I woke up in a strange hotel in Edgar in Hungary, for Christ's sake, thinking something's left the world. I didn't know why. I had no idea it was a death, but I knew something. And, no kidding. And it's true. I mean, so I, I felt him leave. My brothers would, and, and he was, you know, he was, he was uh, shell shocked and all that. Um, and he had a wooden cross that he had carved. You know, they give them these little projects to do in the veterans' hospitals. Had his little wooden cross that he hung on a leather chain, which I now have. Uh, and he always would finger it so they got real smooth and oily. 
my brother's wooden cross. My brother wears a wooden cross about his neck, an old leather boot string, its chain, and he hums amazing grace as he sucks in oxygen from the large green tanks of his dying. He cannot walk down the stairs anymore to the two hot kitchen and white coffee cups, the ashtrays brimming with cigarette butts, so he stays in his bedroom staring across the street at the white Christ that hangs from the white cross of St. Stephen's Church. He is waiting for him to move. He is waiting for him to say a word, any word my brother can hear. My brother wears a wooden cross about his neck and he rubs it oily and smooth every night. The cross helps him dream of Maureen, his first girlfriend, the milk route he worked those upstate New York winter 5 a.m.s. The cross knows his real name and calls him till he wakes. Someday soon my brother will lie in a casket in Fitzgerald's funeral home where his father and grandfather have lain and he will have the wooden cross and the white shirt of his chest and an old leather bootstring that is its chain. Everyone who sees him will see the cross too and think again he was insane. My brother won't see the flames of angels and Sears windows anymore or walk from Cohoes to Waterford and below zero winter with a piece of crumpled paper in his pocket that says no more war. His eyes will be closed, his mouth stitched shut. He will not hear the clumps of dirt that turn his day into final dark. My brother will be gone with his wooden cross and the old leather bootstring hung about his neck. Okay, uh, here's a poem that's my father speaking to me again. I like snow. I'm from upstate New York originally, and I guess you get snow here. <laughs> Do you get a lot of snow in Spring? Well, I love snow. Um, I'm going to read two snow poems next. This is called My Father's Forecast. He always comes down and warns me about things, <laughs> tries to, which is ironic. My father died when he was 47. My brother died when he was 47. Magic numbers. I'm 42. <laughs> My father's forecast. The chunk of oak snapped in the black stove as I sat with my father's face in my hands, his nights of cigarettes rising with each breath until he ran out of the row house for more. He was grim-lipped as though he knew he was coming to this behind thin glass, completely still at last, no more Guam or Guadalcanal, no more mad woman in a blue nightgown threatening him with a butcher knife as he tried to drink his third bottle of beer each night. In the picture, he was younger than I was, his voice higher, almost a whine when he spoke. Son, you've gone wrong. Look at you, misshapen back, that awful cough, prostate kidney, Prostate infection, kidney infection, indigestion, it all comes from a sour heart. I know, didn't I stay up those nights on Olmstead Street to rock until the linoleum wore out in two long ruts and the cold hour came with its black wings to carry me off? And when you wake, don't mistake the maple's branches clattering at your window for my voice. This is me, not the hard east wind telling you what to do and to do it soon for there's colder weather coming tomorrow and huge drifts of snow. Uh, here's another one which I, I'd like to go out to shovel the snow out still falling. And my wife always yells at me. She says, why don't you wait until the snow stops falling and then go out and shovel it? And I can't tell her, one of the reasons is usually when I'm shoveling the snow, I have the feeling that my father and my grandfather are with me because um, she still thinks I'm relatively sane. <laughs> uh, I think she thinks that. This is called shoveling while the snow keeps falling. How many times have I found myself out here shoveling while the flakes keep falling? The low rumble of my voice like that of the shovel as it scrapes the pitted concrete. My wife's words in my ears, why go out while it's still snowing? 
I can't tell her my father comes back when it snows like this, his brown collar up, the flakes caught in his big wave of hair where they slowly crumple and melt, that he walks down close to the house, especially at night, bowing through the spruce, knocking clumps of snow from branches and small explosive puffs. I used to think he wanted to talk about his wife, my mother, about the day she left and he stood by the canal fence and wept, but instead he whispers the shine of the 52 Buick, tells me he lit candles as an altar boy, then asks the names of the presidents again, says the next time he comes, he'll expect me to know the states and their capitals, the ones I've been repeating the past 30 years of my life. When he squats and makes drawings in the snow, I can't see clearly. He tells me he knows I've been fucking up, but it's all right. He can tell I'm learning to open myself despite the fearful dreams my mother still breathes into my head of my wife leaving with another man, of my sons and daughters being hit by a speeding car. It's not easy, he sighs, waving his hands in the blue-black air as though there were wind, telling me as I straighten my back that I can't afford to stop and talk, just keep shoveling no matter how cold my toes get, no matter how many times the snow covers the clean walk. I guess that's a metaphor. Poor. You know, you just keep shoveling and hope. Okay, I like to uh, read a couple of poems that people ask me to read from Sweet Ones. First one is another spring. I don't, are you all okay? <laughs> all right, well, when I'm in class and people look like that, I say, just shake your heads. You don't have to say anything, just nod. Um, this is called Another Spring on Olmsted Street. As you can tell, I've got this love-hate relationship with my mother that's mostly hate. Um, but this is one of the more tender approaches to this woman. It's still alive. Another Spring on Olmsted Street. She's out there again with her five-cent packets of seeds for green beans and beets, the small tomato plants humped in green cardboard containers. On her left, a box of sifted soil. On her right, the brown beer bottle. Alva sings, love me tender, from the open window as she scoops the soft roots in the palm of her hand before setting them in. A dog barks. A car rattles down the alley, but she has gone so completely into the stems and leaves that not one of us watching from the house dares to go out and touch her bare shoulder. Not one of us calls her name into the beginning dark where she dreams and digs, where she buries time and again her white, white hand. And the other one is the Alzheimer poem. My Uncle Chauncey drove my Aunt Eleanor and strangely enough, my mother gave me this. I don't know if you have mothers like this, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I talk to her maybe twice a year, and I usually call her, but whenever she calls me, the first thing out of her mouth is bad news. You know, your Uncle Chauncey died, or, or you know, your, your Aunt Eleanor, or your Aunt B now weighs 350 pounds, or, or always something just awful, you know, or, or Jimmy just had a second stroke, and, and the dog died, all right, always this first line. So whenever she, whenever I hear a voice, the first word or two, I, I click in because I use the lines. And this is, <laughs> this is what she said. She said, hello, Lenny, your Uncle Chauncey is driving your Aunt Eleanor 200, over 200 miles every day. And I'm thinking, okay, now why? And then she told me, which is true. Uh, the poem begins with that line. My Uncle Chauncey drove my Aunt Eleanor over 200 miles every day because she had Alzheimer's, couldn't remember where she was, where she had been, and had to see the elephants in the zoo again, stop in to see her friend Rose for the third day in a row. When they left the house, he had his teeth clenched deep in his jaw. She was smiling, 16 again, bowing to swoop up the tall stemmed tulips, ooing and eyeing as she looked into the yellow and red, ripping the petals off in puffs of circus colors just before she skipped the rest of the way down the walk. Sometimes she'd call him Pete or William or some other man's name, 
and hold his hand away she had never held his hand and Chauncey would get jealous, although he was 62 and knew her mind was riddled with time like the rotten oak log in his backyard the carpenter ants had eaten their way through. Holding the car door for her to slide in, he'd shout, who's Bill? And who in hell are Merrill and Ray? What in hell have you been doing all these years? But she'd just bend over to ask in that low, sweet voice that had so recently come back, if he would please peel out the way he used to, leave smoldering tracks by the yellow curb in front of their house. I wanted to send this book to my Uncle Chauncey. I, I, over dinner, I was telling some people that I hadn't talked to him in 30 years, and I wrote to him, or written to him in 30 years. I wrote him a letter three or four days ago. I really wanted to send him my books of poetry, but how can you send him a poem like that? How can, you know? I, so I couldn't do it. So I picked out a couple of magazines that had poems in them and, and sent them. I like to read a poem for my son. This is a, a, a light poem. It's, a very, it's one of my, this is, I think is my very favorite poem. It's called, it's not, in, not it's called this in a book, but in, in, in the magazine where it was published, it's called The Moment. It's the first poem in Sun, and it's for Joshua L. Roberts, Joshua Leonard Roberts. The only thing you need to know is when I say tears, behind my house, the land is landscaped in tears. It's not landscaped, it's just bulldozed in three tears, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a farm. It's a, it was a farm, okay? The moment. Walking the three tears in first light out here so my two-year-old son won't wake the house, I watch him pull and strip ragweed, chicory, yarrow, so many other weeds and wildflowers I don't know the names for, saying big and mine and Joshua. Words, words, words. Then it is the moment, that split second when he takes my hand, gives it a tug, and I feel his entire body weight, his whole heart weight, pulling me toward the gleaming flowers and weeds he loves. That moment which is eternal and is gone in a second. When he yanks me out of myself like some sleeper from his dead dream sleep into the blues and whites and yellows I must bend down to see clearly. Into the faultless flesh of his soft hands, into his new brown eyes, the miracle of him and of the earth itself where he lives among the glitterings and takes me. I like that poem for Josh. Um, Uh, I think I'm going to skip back to the darker poems. Yeah. All right. well, how long should I go now? I start at 7.15. It's 8 o'clock. You, well, you tell me. I don't mind. But, I mean, if... Uh, in fact, I like it. <laughs> uh... Talk about, let me read a new poem that, that's with me every day, the fear that something will happen to Josh or, you know, I, it's just, it's, sometimes it's overwhelming when I think of those black wings getting him and here getting, getting Nancy, my wife. It's, this happened in Hungary. We had an ice storm and she went out and she took him and I wished after they had left that she hadn't taken him. It's called Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Okay, I don't think any poetry magazine is ever going to publish it because of the title, but. <clears throat> You'd been gone less than an hour, and already I had seen the blue Jetta spinning on an icy corner, your face cracked against the windshield, lines of blood. And I saw our boy hurled into the blackness at your feet, the small hands open, fixed, yet, when you both rush through the winter door, your arms full with bags of groceries, his mittened hands holding a new red ball, I walked out to greet you as though the black angel had not spread his wings across my face again or pecked at my eyes with his bony beak or slit my chest with his claw knife. I kissed you on the cheek and tossed the ball with Josh as though I were the same man you had left, then hung up your heavy coat stuffed the scarf into the empty left sleeve 
set his boots neatly near the radiator, which hissed and rattled with heat. You know, that's the way, you know? I think you know what I mean. Those of you, and if, those of you who are just children, you must realize that your parents feel that way. So when they tell you to be in by 12, that's why they're telling you to be in by, or two, or whatever it is. Right. Um, I, I, I was talking a little about religion, and I don't, I love John Logan's poetry. I don't know if any of you know Logan's poetry, but he's, he's, he's not well known, not as well known as he should be, I think. And anyway, I, I've been thinking about religion this past year, which is very strange for me, except to mock it. As, okay? this, is, this is one of the feelings. The, in Page Hungary, you know, the communists don't allow religion officially, so the people who go really take a risk because sometimes there's a guy on the corner writing the names down. Um, and I live next to the church, a Paulite church. This is called Near the Paulite Church, Page Hungary. And they've got the worst bells in Europe. That, that, I mean, they are toneless, at least in Hungary. Germany, I think, got all the good metal after World War II or something because all the bells in Hungary and in Poland that I heard just clang. They don't have any tone, you know, like we have... So this bell would just tone, this toneless bell would just bang me awake. Near the poor light church, page hungry. For the first six months, I did not know the bells were clanging me to mass at 7, 20, 12, and again at 6. Their uneven tolling, waking me from sleep, from books, from dark. I would have gone on November 1st, the day my father sat straight up in his piss-stained sheets and died of a weak heart. I would have knelt on Christmas Eve and February 13th to celebrate Christ's birth and my son's birth, would have stared and prayed and dropped money in the basket for a God I'm not sure exists. But I am not worthy of the small wooden cross nor the gospel lines my friend David sends. On an ordinary Tuesday, I bow my head. Nothing stirs. I don't know who or what is dead. Uh, let me just read a couple more, okay? Um, it's a great audience. You're not all leaving. <laughs> uh, I know, I know. Just a couple minutes. Uh, um, in in line with this, with this new year I've had, I've. I've been thinking back to affairs I used to have, you know, um, and what they meant, what they mean, which is something we don't all talk about, right? Uh, those of us who are old enough who had to hide them at some point in their lives. This poem is called What Next? Now that I know where the glasses are kept, the plates, the knives and forks and spoons, and I know most of the faces in the pictures that stare from the various shelves, some of their lives, who they supposedly loved, what next? And now that you have seen my coin trick, the giant snowman I build every winter, heard the hesitant cough of my heart that is so much my father's, what more do you expect? This is all the world is, my friend said on the telephone last night, and I said, yes, yes tasting the chilled grapefruit and gin on my tongue again, feeling the lace of your red and black camisole, letting my mind enter that space where our bodies touched, feeling the sweat there and the love and the hate, the sudden flaring up and the settling, always the settling back into the dark. Now, how do you send a poem like that to somebody? <laughs> I thought about it, but I'm not doing it, uh, to tell you the truth. You know, I want to read a, a, a new poem and one other. Read a new poem and then one other, and that's it, okay? Uh, yeah. 
you might not like this, this is a country poem that Hayden Carruth gave it five stars. Th the poem's called Three Stars, so there's a little joke in it. Okay. Three Stars, Wassergas, which is where I live, Pennsylvania. As I hauled hay to the barn for the horse and cow, I was suddenly stopped by the violet and blue-gray clouds of January Pennsylvania sunset, that cold iron hue that flared up to end the few clear days. The woods were stripped and three stars glimmered behind the black branches that marked the far line of my property. Two small yellow white stars and one pale green, the star of hope I'd come to look for these past four years. Turn around three times when you first sight three stars, my crazy Indian grandfather always said, although stars were hard to see on Olmsted Street. And so I spun in the foot of snow to the sound of his voice and the hollow wind which his voice had joined, my legs crossing the way his crossed on the brown porch as he danced from light into dark. Dusk is the sacred time of ghosts returning when souls appear to pursue their bodies, stretching into below zero cold their vast snow wings, and I was there to watch them. More snow devils and snow angels than I could count as they whipped off the barn roof, and I no longer wanted to ask where they had gone or what they did, more than satisfied, awed by those moments white and light as snow, or the soul, if it exists, that passed beneath three dim stars. It's a positive poem. It's, um, this is the last poem. It's for my father also. It's called The Truth although it's not the truth. Uh, it's the final poem in Black Wings. The truth. My father walks in with the dirt smell of the roads all over him, sits with the gold glass of Schaefer's and pours the coins from his leather purse, nickels, dimes, pennies, quarters, piled in a mound that we separate and count and roll. But tonight he is not whistling. He is not rolling 20 quarters in two seconds with two fingers. And he is telling me his busted knuckle is from a softball, not a punch. The hose in his face from pimples, not jungle rot. He is slicing his left hand, although I cannot believe it, lifting it onto the metal table and telling me he bleeds like anyone else. When I get up to put on the Tommy Edwards album, he coughs, says I love her, I love her although she's in another town with her fat Irishman resting on the Mediterranean couch without one thought of him. Listen, he shouts, as I start to move in the circles he taught me. I'm a bum, a drunk, and he holds my chin up, so I must look into the bloodshot eyes, his greased back hair, the holes in his face dark as caves. See the kitchen light that glares behind him, his shadow up there on the tin ceiling, where vines tangle and untangle, where thick white clusters of flowers bloom. That's it. Thank you. Uh, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, please stay for a reception books for sale, but also Mulberry Poets and Writers, sort of the sister organization, uh, is going to be having a workshop with Madeline Tiger, poet from New Jersey. Uh, it's on November 5th, and anybody who is interested in participating in that workshop should submit two poems and five dollars by October 19th. If you want details, Charlotte Ravioli or Karen Bonin will be able to give them to you tonight. Thank you for coming. Dave, can I